Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for bringing us to the conclusion of the studies and the revelations and the messages from you to the churches in Asia Minor and to the church today. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you can see and you know what goes on in every heart and what goes on in every spirit and in every one that calls the name of the Lord. And you know what goes on in the heart of every church? By your actions are weighed. Motives are measured. Intentions are told. You know all things at all times. In all people, in all churches, in all ages. And for those who live commendable lives. Lives that please you. Lives that honor you. Your promises are yes and amen for them. And as we come to this study tonight, Lord, we pray you reveal yourself to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as we gather before you in this solemn assembly. And we listen to the promises that you have given to the people that have ears to hear. What the Spirit has to say to the churches. We pray, Lord, you give us ears to hear tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that your promises will be so real to us. That we are so eager to fulfill the conditions and the terms you lay down in your word. Help us, Lord, to look straight at your face through the Spirit and through the Scriptures. Make us hear from you. Make us lean upon you. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As you already know, we've been studying the messages of the Lord Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And you see that these churches, I told you at the very beginning, that there is a personal application. There is a perennial association. Personal association, perennial application, and then there is a prophetic anticipation. Which means then, the messages are not just for those churches at that time. The messages are for the people today, the people who are looking up to the Lord, serving the Lord, following after the Lord. And as we have looked at each of those seven churches, and we have seen the commendation as well as the correction that the Lord had to give to those churches. And we have made application of those messages to each individual life, to your life and to my life. We come now to bring everything together summarize everything but then the way we're doing it we're looking at the overcomers because at the end of every chapter at the end of every message at the end of every epistle at the end of every revelation given to each of those churches the lord jesus christ speaks to those who will overcome he spoke about overcomers in this way to him that overcometh in that language to him that overcomes, there is a present sense of being an overcomer. You are overcoming today. But then the accumulation, the climax, the culmination of the overcoming life comes at the very end. And then you are a final overcomer. And in that sense, there are promises that are made to those who are overcoming now, who will keep on overcoming, and then their overcoming will come to a climax, a culmination, a conclusion. When Jesus Christ comes, then they finally overcome. And then you have the promises of God to them. Look at verse 7, chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 in the middle. To him that overcometh. And then as we come to verse 11, it tells us in the latter part, he that overcometh, you come to verse 17, in the middle part, to him that overcometh. And then as he moves on, he still keeps on talking to the overcomers. Verse 26, he that overcometh. And then in chapter 3, reading there in verse 5, he that overcometh overcometh you move down and you come then to verse to verse 9 
he gives the promise to the people. And then he said, I'm going to make them of the, of the synagogue of Satan. We say they are Jews and they are not. But do you lie? Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And they will know that I have loved you. Then verse 12, him that overcometh. Keeps on talking to only the overcomers. Then in verse 21 of chapter 3, to him that overcometh. You will see that in the messages that Jesus gave to all the churches, he had nothing for those who will not overcome. He had nothing for those who will compromise. He had nothing for those who will continue to be defeated by the devil, by the flesh, and by the world. He had nothing for the people that will be backsliders. But the people he had something for, the people he had the eternal glory, the glory to come, he had for them, is for the overcomers only. And these overcomers, what did he tell them? He gave them promises. And so you find that to every church at the end, and then from that church on to the churches that will be, and then from the churches that will be to the individual believers that will believe on the Lord, he gave the promises. Come back to chapter 2. I'm reading it to you from verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. It's telling us that getting to heaven will not be a congregational affair. It will not be a fellowship affair. It will not be an assembly affair. It will be for the individual. Because at the end, after speaking to the angel of the church in Ephesus, and the church in Smyrna, and the church in Pagamos, and the church in Tatira, and the angel of the church in Sardis, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Lest anybody should think that those messages are only meant for the angels, for the leaders of the churches, at the end of every message he said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then he follows on in verse 7. To him that overcometh, will I give to each of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Come on to verse 10 and verse 11. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says on the judges. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in a second death. He gives a promise again to the overcomer in verse 17. In verse 17 he says, he that has an ear, always like that. He that has an ear, let him hear. You know that the Lord does not force any blessing on us, does not force even heaven on us, will not force the eternal glory on you, will not force salvation on you, will not force sanctification on you, will not force the blessing of the cross upon you. It is he that has an ear to hear. Let him hear. And then he goes on in that verse 17. To him that overcometh, will I give to it of the healing manna, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving except he that receiveth it. Jump down to verse 25. And that which ye have already, hold fast till I come, and he that overcometh. I want you to see the emphasis of Jesus because I need to tell you once again, getting to heaven is not a family affair. Children, if the children are going to get to heaven, he that overcometh, each child will face the Lord himself. Salvation is personal. Decision is personal. Conviction is personal. Entrance into heaven is personal. Having this fulfillment of the promise of God to the overcomers, it is personal. Husband, it's personal. Wife, it's personal. It's not a family affair. It's not a church affair. It's not a denominational affair. It says very clearly, verse 26, he, the individual, who overcomes, and he keeps my words unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shivers. 
even as I received of my father, and I will give him singular. Not I will give them. Will you please understand? I belong to deeper life. And deeper life is teaching the Bible. And deeper life is faithful. Deeper life is loyal. Deeper life is Christ honoring, God exalting, Bible believing. That's not enough, my brother. My brother is going to be very personal on that final day. My dear sister, there, it's going to be very, very personal on that final day. Because it says in verse 28, I will give him, singular, the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Everywhere it's just to that individual that overcomes. That's why I need to emphasize to you tonight, we have Christ's promise to the overcomers. In chapter 3, verse 5, he that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name. Singular. Are you born again? Singular. Are you sanctified? Singular. Are you faithful to the Lord? Singular. Are you obeying the commandments of the Lord? Have you made up your mind? Have you purposed in your heart like Daniel purposed in his heart? Singular. To each individual person, the face of another one, the righteousness of another person, the holiness of another person, the conquering attitude, conquering spirit of another person will not carry you. Singular. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I'm going to verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. We say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come before you, come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the watch of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come on all the earth to try them that dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou, singular, thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him, singular, him that overcometh, Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? And he shall go no more out, and I will give, I will write upon him, singular, the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven for my God. And I will write upon him, singular, my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then we come to verse 21, chapter 3. To him, singular. You've got the point now. To him that overcometh. Will I grind to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. And I'm set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 7. Here again, you notice the singular that the Lord, the individual that the Lord is talking to. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh, still singular, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, singular. You will find then that each epistle, each message from Christ to the churches ends with a promise to the overcomers. Each promise has been given, not only to the overcomers in that particular church, but to all overcomers in every age, in every generation, all over the world, all times. All overcomers in all churches from the beginning of time until Christ returns. They will have these promises that the Lord has given. 
But then the condition of inheriting the promises is the same. For all periods of time. Do you know that although times change, God does not change. Christ does not change. The condition of entering into heaven does not change. And the terms of the fulfillment of these promises to the overcomers, these terms, these conditions, they do not change. And God is not going to judge you, my dear brother, my dear sister, on the basis of the doctrine of your denomination. And you cannot say, well, God... I wasn't a member of Deeper Life. I wasn't a member of the Assemblies of God. I wasn't a member of a Pentecostal church. Or I wasn't a member of an Evangelical church in our church. This is what we believe. So God, if you're going to judge me, won't you judge me on the basis of the teaching, the doctrine of our denomination? Because I was very faithful to all the things our denomination taught us. The Lord is not going to judge you, my brother, my sister, on the basis of the doctrine of any denomination. It's going to come back to the word of God, to him that overcometh. And the condition is the same. Whether he's dealing with the believers in the early church, or he's dealing with the believers in the 21st century, it's all the same. That's why you want to screw up yourself, tighten your belt, Look at the Word of God and look at the conditions in the Word of God and see that these conditions that the Lord has laid down, you don't play with them. You want to be an overcomer on that final day because the condition of inheriting the promises of God, that condition is the same for all periods of time, for all believers in ancient times. And in these modern times, until the end of time, the unchanging Christ does not vary its requirements or terms with different churches in different places at different times. It remains the same. It remains constant. Each message closes with he that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches because Christ was talking to every individual. And he's still talking to every individual today. At the end of each message to each church, he calls your attention. The attention of every individual to consider the message and to be an overcomer. And thus become a partaker of the promised eternal blessings. The message to each church was not to be limited then to that church. It's what the Spirit says. Do you see that? It's not what the Spirit said in the past tense. What the Spirit says, what the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit continues to say unto the churches. In the first three messages, you'll notice something. He that has an ear to hear comes before he that overcomes. But in the last four messages, he that overcomes comes before he that has an ear to hear. And which means, as the Lord Jesus Christ interchanged those things, the first three, this is the sentence that came first, then after that, he that overcometh. Then the last four, he that overcometh comes first, he that has an ear to hear comes second, which means they are interchangeable. Which means, it's the people that have ears to hear, they are the people that eventually overcome. The people that eventually overcome are the people that are listening. They will not allow the word of God to drop to the ground. They are never in a hurry. They are never impatient. They want to hear. I want to know the terms, the condition, whereby the Lord will use his key and open the gate of heaven for me. When I get there, that's the people. They are listening and they are eager. They want to know. They want to obey. They want to believe. And they want to practice what the Lord is telling them. Those are the people that eventually overcome. There are three points i'm going to deal with number one proper pers proper perspectives of an overcoming character proper perspectives of an overcoming character number two prevailing power of an overcoming christian the prevailing power of an overcoming christian and then number three promised paradise for overcomers and conquerors the promised paradise Overcomers and conquerors. Come back to number one. Proper perspectives of an overcoming character. Now, when it says to him that overcometh, 
And there are some people that oversimplify, that watch over common. And they don't understand the depths of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They don't understand the height of the revelation of Jesus Christ. They do not understand the breadth of the mysteries of the kingdom. They do not understand uh, the, the weight of the requirement of the Lord. And every time it says to him that overcometh, they say, well, that means every believer, your Savior forever saved. And there was a time you raised up your hand and you said, I received the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. They say, those are the overcomers. My friend, that's oversimplifying the matter. In fact, that's unscriptural. In fact, that is not true. When he says to him that overcometh, what did he mean? Look at the word of God in chapter 2 of Revelation. He just told them in chapter 2, he said, you have left your first love. And then he said, repent or else I'll come to you and remove your candlestick from his place except you repent. After that, he said to him that overcometh. What that means is the people that overcome their lethargy. Their lukewarmness, the people that overcome their hard heartedness, the people that overcome their lack of affection, and they recover the false love back. And they repent, and they turn around, and the fire, and the affection, and the warmth of the false love is not burning in their soul. Those are the people in Ephesus that overcame. And then he said, You have them there that hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. After that, in verse 7, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. If you have ears to hear, it says, There are doctrines I, Christ, I hate. And if you have ears to hear, and you want to be an overcomer, you will hate the doctrines, the false doctrines that Jesus hates. Those are the overcomers. And then you will not be deceived. You will not be led astray into false doctrine, into saying it doesn't matter what we do, that the spirit is all right, although the flesh might do whatever it wants to do. No. The people that Jesus spoke to, he said, look at the problem here. Look at the problem here. Look at the problem there. Immediately after that, he said, he that overcometh, if you get rid of those problems, and the false doctrine of the Nicolaitans is not in your life. I will count you. Church of Ephesus, any other person like Ephesus, I'll count you as an overcomer. That's the proper perspective of the overcomer. And look at it in, in John chapter 16. Who are the overcomers? In John chapter 16, reading from verse 33. John 16, 33. These six have I spoken unto you. That in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What did Jesus mean then when he said the overcomer? Oh, the people that overcome the world, like Jesus Christ overcame the world. All the pollutions of the world, all the practices of the world, all the politics of the world, all the deception of the world, all the hypocrisy of the world, all the lip service of the world, all the tradition of the world, Jesus overcame. Come to Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It says to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as... Even as, exactly as, I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Jesus overcame the world. And the proper perspective of overcoming is that you overcome all the things that Jesus overcame. And it came at one, at one time. They wanted to take Jesus to make him a king. So he can be giving them bread and fish to eat without walking. And Jesus ran away from them. He overcame the world. And the people of the world, they wanted him to do this or do this. He overcame the world. He was there on the cross hanging, suffering for us. And the people of the world said, come down from the cross. Don't suffer. 
If you can come down from the cross, we will believe you. He overcame. He remained on the, on the cross. He remained in the will of God. The people that overcome. All the temptations coming from the world as Christ overcame. That's the proper perspective. Look at First John. First John chapter 5. Reading from verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And that's the real evidence of salvation. It's not enough. You know, I went to the crusade and when the preacher said, raise up your hand, I raised up my hand. That's not enough, my friend. The evidence says this. If you're an overcomer, you'll be overcoming the world. You'll be overcoming the temptations, the secrets of the world, the hard drugs of the world, the alcohol of the world, the prostitution of the world, the homosexuality of the world, and all those evil things of the world. If you're a real child of God, the proper perspective of an overcomer's life is that you overcome all those practices of the world. Look at it. Whosoever, whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you become an overcomer. The grace of God, the strength of the Lord will pass into your life. You will overcome in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, the overcomer, verse 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What does that mean? In this world, nobody will live in this world without somebody offending you. Some people will throw stones at you. Stones of insulting words, bad words. Corrupt words, slandering words, blasphemous words, piercing words that will pierce you to the marrow. But it says that's evil. They do evil to you. If you're going to be an overcomer, the grace of God in you will make you to overlook that and go your way. Not reply them. Not revenge. Not retaliate. You threw that at me, okay, I'm going to pick up a harder thing and throw at you. No, that's not an overcomer. They told lies against me, all right, I know what to do. I have mouth to, I know how to tell lies. I'm going to tell a bigger lie on you. That's not an overcomer. You did not help me when I needed help. Now you need help, I will not help you. That's not an overcomer. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome good, overcome evil with good. Love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them. All these people that blasphemously talk about you, pray for them. And when you find in the church, some people gathered around and they said something about a pastor. And the pastor, because of that, Maybe he was disciplined. And eventually the pastor will say, all right. Then he will have some individuals, while he's on discipline sitting at the back bench somewhere, he'll have a CID. The people that will be detectives in the church. All the meetings they're having, everything, the people that are contributing and saying something negative about me, come and be telling me so that I'll be writing that then. Ah, discipline is not forever. I will come back. And then there are all those detectives uh, there that are bringing information to him, information that will be hardening his heart, information that will be putting bitterness hatred in his heart, information that he'll be writing on the diary when I go back there, those people, I will deal with them. I am sitting down for a few months. I'm going to put them in the cooler. Yes, they will never smell ministry. Not because they offended, but because the CID came to give information to them that at the time of your discipline, this is the person that contributed, this is the person that said, this is the person that said that, all right, leave me with them. And then they will, during the discipline, they will come to 
the general superintendent and say, Sir, I thank God for this discipline. It has shaped me up. It has renewed my life. It has reformed me and refined me. In fact, if I wasn't disciplined, I wouldn't know where I would have been. But now things are wonderful. In fact, I'm not even interested, and they're telling me lies, I'm not even interested in preaching now. All I'm interested is to see Jesus, my Lord. Blessed Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Loving Jesus. I want to see when Jesus Christ will come ministry preaching anytime the lord leads you to restore me i am there i am not in a hurry i just want to serve the lord it's a lie and then eventually they are restored after they are restored then they put on their coat of revenge i have come it's not forever everything is over now i am now in charge and then they stay at the gate. You, come here. You, come here. You, come here. I know what you did. I know what you said. They bring it out of the diary. And they begin to punish innocent people. Oppress the people of God in the church. Because their CID informed them, you are not an overcomer. We overcome evil with good. Whatever people do against you, be like Jesus Christ. Here we see him hanging on the cross of Calvary. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that prayer was answered. It was the answer to that prayer that made 3,000 to be converted on the day of Pentecost. It was the answer to that prayer that gives us Acts chapter 6 verse 7. And a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. Those were the priests that crucified the Lord. Those were the priests that rejected the Lord. But he prayed for them. And the Lord answered the prayer. And Jesus said... The people I'm giving the promise to, they are the people that overcome, even as I have overcome. Uh, listen to me. In our church here, we don't keep a preacher in one place forever and ever. And we follow Bible standard. And there are times that a preacher, a pastor, is transferred out of a location. But he had not had a chance to punish his enemies before he left that location. He had not had a chance to use authority over the people that did not submit to his leadership. And he said, ah, how can they transfer me like this? So and so is there. So and so is there. So and so is there. I should have dealt with them. Even if I'm going to be transferred, all right, I know what to do. And then a new leader comes in. And then the leader will call the new leader and say, huh, this location they brought you to, I've been here for some years now. This place, this is a tough, hard place. The generality of the people are okay. They are good. But there are some people, if you want to enjoy your ministry here, if you don't want them to spoil the work in your hand, if you want to actually do something significant here, you don't know the people, but I'll tell you. So and so, if you get him involved in any good thing in the church, you're going to ruin your ministry. So and so, so and so, he will give him a list of names. And these are the list of names that maybe they had offended him. If he had remained there, he would have been able to punish them, but now they have transferred him. And he's not going to have a chance to punish them. And so he must transfer the hatred and the revenge. He must transfer it to the new leader. So that the new leader will deal with those people. You are not an overcomer. If you are an overcomer, you overcome evil with good. See, this beautiful fellowship here. As we just love one another. Who can be against any of our members here? Any of our workers here? Never mind. Apart from, you know, I stand out there. Well, I know what I'm doing. You're good, good people. You love the Lord. You want to serve the Lord. If you are late for five minutes, I'm at frown at you and say, why are you late? And that doesn't, all that is just, you know, administration. But apart from that, things are going on well. How can somebody have 
rigid hatred, bitterness against any of our people here. We are called to take these people to heaven. And then we'll be giving their names to the leaders coming after us. Punish them for me. Punish them for me. If we're going to be overcomers, we will be people that forget all about this revenge, all this retaliation, just serve the Lord and have the joy of the Lord in your life. God will do it. When Jesus said to him that he overcometh them, he was talking to people in the context of each message to each church. He who overcomes is he who gains the victory. He who conquers. He who is a conqueror over all the evil that Jesus Christ pointed out in all those churches. From Christ's own perspective, the overcomer is he who triumphs over the evil and false prophets of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. He who regains and retains his first love for Christ. He who remains faithful till the end in spite of persecution. He who keeps on holding to the faith and to the truth in spite of pressures from Satan and his agents. He who remains free from the influence of worldly loss and from the fleshly loss of Jezebel and her children. The people that overcome, that the people that continually keep themselves from the depths of Satan, from the diabolical mysteries of the evil one he who holds fast the truth as it is in christ holding the unadulterated truth till the end and he who keeps his garment of righteousness clean and white unstained unspotted till the end he who continually keeps christ's word refusing to deny christ's name when challenged by the synagogue of Satan. He who remains victorious in times of testing or temptation. He who continually resists the lukewarmness and remains zealous for Christ and for the truth of the Lord. The person that enthrones Christ in his heart. Those are the overcomers. And sometimes when I sit back here and I listen to our preachers, some things they say surprise me. Not that they are wrong. They are sharing from their experience, but sometimes it surprises me. One of our preachers here was preaching. And he said that a member of the church had been undisciplined. And the pastor restored that sister. Go back to work. Everything is all right now. And the sister came back to work. And the wife of the pastor saw that sister and said, What are you doing here? Oh, the pastor has restored me. I'm all right now. I prayed, and by the grace of God, things are fine. No, I don't know that yet. Go back home. Your husband, the pastor, restored me. No, go back. And then she went back. And she saw pastor. Excuse me, sir. You restored me the other time, isn't it? Yes. Your wife told me that the discipline is not over yet. I should go back home. Ah, if my wife told you that, I bring back the discipline. Is this Bible? Why? Women. What bitterness do you have in the heart against your dear sisters? What unpardonable sin has your dear sister committed? That the pastor of the church, your husband, who ought to be your head, who ought to rule over you at home and in the church, restored a member of the church. And you, dear sister, you will be so authoritative and openly contradict your husband and say the lady should still go home. This should not be that kind of authority, we are not giving you that kind of authority. If you are not careful, you will become like that Jezebel that maketh herself a prophetess. If you know anything about the sister that you knew before, you will check up, my dear sister, I love you, I have nothing against you. But the reason I felt that you are not alright is this, this, this. 
Oh, and the sister will say, yes, it was like that before, but I prayed, and I'm all right now. And when they say they're all right now, give them a chance, believe them, accept them. Who are we holding on to this kind of whip and rod in the hand? You want to kill the church and kill every member, send them back home? What authority are you giving yourself? Be an overcomer. Overcome your own hatred. Overcome your own self-will. Overcome your own uh, spirit of village headmaster, headmistress now. <laughs> you understand? Let's overcome all those things and be a child of God and live in love and live in affection so that the blessing of God will be upon your life, will be upon your ministry, will be upon your husband and will be upon your family and upon the whole church. It will be so in Jesus' name. I come to point number two. Prevailing power of an overcoming Christian. I told you it is. It is personal. The prevailing power of an overcoming Christian. I turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We're reading there, uh, looking at the power, prevailing power that makes us to overcome. Revelation chapter 12. From verse 9. And a great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which, receiveth the, which deceiveth the whole world, it was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. That's the power to overcome. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ. Faith in the atoning blood. Faith in the protecting blood. Faith in the energizing blood. Faith in the blood that covers us. It says they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. And by the watch of their testimony. And they loved not their lives on today's, what that means is, they say, I'm going to stand by my conviction. I'm going to stand by my post, no matter what happens. Those are the people that overcome. There's a purpose of heart. There's a decision in the mind. There's a commitment to the Lord. And then there is faith in the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, and where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. This, when you are holding on to the name of the Lord, there's power in that name. And to the watch of the Lord, there's power in that word. Number one, the blood. Number two, the name. Number three, the word. That gives you the victory. Chapter 3, Revelation verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the watch of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come on all them to try them that dwell on the face of the earth. That is, your obedience to the Lord. That gives you power. When you obey the Lord, and then the Lord whispers in your heart, I'm pleased in you. I'm pleased in you. That gives you strength within. That gives you courage with conviction within. You are happy. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. You know, when the Lord is always telling you that, I appreciate that way you overcame that uh, temptation. 
And the way you overcame in that area, and the way you stood your ground in that area, it gives you inner strength. The prevailing power of an overcoming Christian. In First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Reading from verse 12. First John 2, 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you. For his name's sake, a clear conscience. It gives courage and strength. When there's no skeleton in your cupboard, there's no guilt on your heart. Your sins are forgiven. You have the peace of God. That gives you inner strength. In verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him, that is from the beginning when you know the Lord and know the Lord and know the Lord and you know that the presence of the Lord is with you. It gives you inner strength and power. And then it says, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Young men, you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. In verse 14, I have written unto you. Fathers, because ye have known him, that is from the beginning, I written unto you, young men. Why? Because ye are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. When the word of God abides in you, it gives you power. You have your quiet time in the morning. You underline verses of the Bible. And during the day, you are recollecting and remembering and reciting the, the word of God. You underline in the morning and the promises of God and the warning of the Lord and the correction of the Lord. And the examples you saw in the Bible, they are recurring in your mind during the day. That word of God abiding in you gives you inner strength and power to be an overcomer because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. And that's what tells you not to love the world. In verse 15, not, love not the world. Now that the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Second Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 4 and verse 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Can you look up here for a moment? As some of us educated people, uh, you are going to have some difficulties except you deliberately try to overcome the influences of, those, of that kind of education. You know, it was supposed that I've gone to school and we've gone beyond primary school, we've gone beyond the secondary school, what they call grammar school those days, high school. And we've studied some philosophy and some psychology and some of these things that is studied in the world. And you have to study those things so that you, uh, some of those things were compulsory in those instances. They're still compulsory today when you go to school. There are some courses you have to take here and here and there. When you take that psychology, leave it in the classroom, leave it in your faculty. After taking your exam and you pass the exam, leave it there behavioral sciences all those things they taught you whatever is contrary to the bible leave it there the philosophy and all those things all those names leave all those things there when you come to the church and you begin to apply that psychology and that philosophy and you try it on people and you begin to employ this and employ that you're not going to be an overcomer because you're using carnal weapons. They use that in the world. You don't use that in the church. If you want to be an overcomer, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not things that were taught by professors of psychology and philosophy in the world. Leave all those things behind. 
we hypnotize him. Leave all those things in the world. Leave them there. You study them because maybe you didn't have a better cause to study. You have to go into all that rubbish before you, you found yourself out. And what saved you? How you became born again? How you overcome temptation? How you overcome the devil? How you are living the victorious life? It's not based on those psychological things. If you ever live an overcoming life, it will be on the basis of the word of God. Well, that's why we have problems sometimes with some of these educated people. Because they've been educated in the negative way. And the education that they got in the world is uh, it's more visible when you deal with them. More than their faith in the word of God. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. This is what gives the believer, the child of God, the minister prevailing power to become a, an overcoming Christian, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what gives us the power in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, isn't it wonderful that this man, Paul the Apostle, educated Paul the Apostle, as he spoke to Timothy, he didn't pass on to Timothy the education or the psychology, the philosophy he learned from Gamaliel. He passed on to him what he learned from the word of God, inspired by the Spirit of God. And writing to the Ephesians, he didn't pass on to them the psychology and the philosophy of Gamaliel or the Sanhedrin. He passed on to them the real spiritual weapon whereby they'll be able to have prevailing power to be overcoming Christians. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles, against the methods, against the devices, against the methodology and the strategies of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and a sword of the Spirit, which is the watch of God, praying always, that's how to overcome, praying always, that's how to maintain the victory, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me. Paul, why do you need prayer? I thought that as a member of the Sanhedrin, I thought as a person that had been taught under, under Gamaliel, I thought as a persecutor of the church, I thought from your training, you already had the courage. Paul, if you could enter into homes and take people and whisk them into the prison, and you could do those mindless things, cruel things, wicked things, you are naturally bold. How are you telling us to pray for you so you will have utterance? Oh, he said, all that kind of blanket and coat of worldly courage and worldly stamina and worldly method already done them. The things that were gained to me. All those I forsook, and I count them as dung. Now, because I've left all the things I used to depend upon when I was in the world, I am now without any covering, without any strength. All I can use now will be the strength of the Lord. That's why I need to pray for myself, and that's why I need the church to be praying for me. Have you cast off? All the blankets and the methods and the armor of the world... All the hatred of the world, all the malice of the world, 
all the subtle cleverness of the world that we used to oppress people, that we used to get money from people, that we used to extort money from them, have we cast them off? If we're going to be overcomers, the prevailing power in the life of the overcomer, it comes through the spiritual power given by the strength and by the spirit of the Lord praying always. With all prayer and supplication. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. And that's what the Lord is telling us. Actually, the overcoming Christian as Christ living within him. That's how you can overcome. And you have the grace of God, abundance of the grace of God living within you. He has an unwavering faith in Christ's power to keep and in his unfailing promises. The person we're talking about, the overcoming Christian, his spiritual strength is obtained, is maintained, is increased by constant prayer and dependence upon God and his word. Conscious of Christ's presence with him, all the time he lives with the courage and conviction of the one who is in partnership with the mighty conqueror, the captain of his salvation. The overcoming Christian does not depend on his natural strength or human wisdom alone. The greater one lives within him. The unconquerable Christ who is constantly supplying sufficient grace and power as the need arises is the reason for his constant victory. His weapon, the weapons of his warfare, being not carnal but mighty through God, he is able to always pull down strongholds and overcome every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God of the whole armor of God constantly on him, fighting the good fight of faith, with the faith and the vigilance of the people of God, standing firm, without wavering, praying without ceasing, determined to keep the victory, striving against sin in the name of Christ, or the watch of God, and by the power of the Holy Ghost residing within him. That's how he is, he is an overcoming Christian. And he keeps a daily victory as well as a lifetime of triumph. Point number three. The promised paradise for overcomers and conquerors. The promised paradise for overcomers and conquerors. As you look at the promises of God, you'll see that he tells us about heaven. It tells us about the manna in heaven. It tells us about the tree of life in heaven. It tells us about the crown we're going to wear in heaven. It tells us about authority sitting upon the throne we're going to experience in heaven. It tells us about becoming a pillar in the very temple of the living God. It tells us about many, many things. In um, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, begin to look at these things yourself. Here are the things we are going to have. Here are the things we are going to gain when you enter there eventually as an overcoming Christian. In chapter 2 verse 7, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to each of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Adam lost it, Eve lost it, and they were cast out of the garden of Eden. And they could not eat of the tree of life, but then for the overcomer, for the people that will not succumb, that will not submit, that will not yield to the devil, as Adam and Eve yielded to the devil in the garden of Eden, to the people that resist the devil, and you become an overcomer, you will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It tells us in verse 10 and verse 11, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, that ye may be tested. And ye shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death. Be an overcomer, be faithful unto death. And I will give thee, here is the reward, here is the promise. I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The second death is the eternal death. 
The second death is perdition and punishment in the eternal lake of fire. And it says, if you overcome, you will not go to hell. If you overcome, you will escape the pain and the wrath and the judgment and the indignation of God upon the people that die in sin. You'll go to heaven. It tells us in verse 17, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Of the hidden manna. You remember? The children of Israel, they ate manna in the wilderness 40 years. And then Moses told them, because the word of the, the Lord himself, to, the word of the Lord came to Moses, saying, Take part of that manna, and put in the pot, and put in that inside the ark, and hide it in the Holy of Holies. It was hidden there, that the people will know what their fathers ate, when the Lord was mightily present to them. And then he said, He gave them angels food, the corn of heaven. And now here Jesus Christ is saying, there's a kind of hidden, hidden manner. You've never eaten something like this before. Here is angel's food. If you overcome and you get there eventually, it says I will give him also a white stone. That white stone in the olden days, if somebody had been acute, uh, accused in the law court and then he was acquitted, that is, they said, no punishment. No punishment, no policeman, or no law enforcement agent will follow after him. He was free, and free forever. They'll give him a white stone. And Jesus said, if you overcome, when you get to those pearly gates, I will give you a white stone. And that white stone will mean no condemnation forever. No condemnation forever. That now you're free from the judgment of God. And a new name, reaching, which no man knoweth. There is a secret here. There is a mystery here. No man knoweth except he that receiveth it. And then from verse 25 it says, And that which thou hast already hold fast until I come. Until I come. Don't let down. Don't let go. Don't give up. Precious will come. False prophets will come. Tardness of the body will come. Your own man might tell you, are you not going too far? Hold fast. Hold fast until I come. Until the Lord comes. Hey, you remember Asa that worshipped the Lord and served the Lord. And the Bible record says 35 years. 35 years he was faithfully following the Lord. Loyal to the Lord. Obedient to the Lord. Pleasing the Lord. After 35 years he changed. He turned around and he died under the wrath and the judgment of God. You must remember Demas that was following after the, after the Lord with Paul the Apostle. Eventually, he didn't make it to the very end. I'm sure you remember Lord's wife. The angel held their hands. Get out of this city because we have been sent to destroy the city. Look not behind you, but keep on looking forward. Brothers and sisters, that's the victory. That's the victory. Keep on looking forward. The good work you did yesterday, don't look back. The appreciation you made yesterday, don't look back. The credentials you got yesterday, don't look back. And the, the, the praises and, and the honor we gave you yesterday, don't look back. Forgetting the things that are past. I press forward for the mark of the high calling. So that I will be able to apprehend that for which I am apprehended. Keep on moving on. Then it says in verse 26, He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end. These are the words of Jesus. To him will I give power over the nations. That means to rule with him in verse 27. And he shall rule with them with a rod of iron. And as vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I have received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then in chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. He that overcometh, he that overcometh. You cannot fold your hand. Let what will be, be. You cannot fold your hand. Let him give me what he wants to give me. You cannot fold your hand. If he wants me to get to heaven, that's his business. Let him do it. No, you have to do something. You have to be an overcomer. An overcomer. Your personal life, your behavior, your character, your resisting temptation, your resisting the devil. He says, he that overcometh shall be, shall be clothed with, in white raiment. 
and I shall not blot out his name out of the book of life. I will not blot out his name on the basis that he overcomes. But he prostitution overcomes him. Young man, here we are together, studying together. And then your place of work, they send you to go and work somewhere. And you have to stay in a hotel. And as you stay in hotels, if you've been there before, you see some foolish, foolish things that go on. The works of the flesh. Then you forget yourself. You forget who you are. And you allow fornication, adultery, prostitution. You know, these, these people of the world, it will shock you. They don't call it prostitution anymore. They say they are sex workers. Now, the, even human rights, they're defending them now. And these prostitutes will bind together and march across the street and say that they are denying them their rights. That this is their profession. They are sex workers. And as these other workers have their rights, we have our rights. Can you think about that? Homosexuals, they, they say they have their rights. And you people, if you do not know you, who you are, and they send you here, they send you there, and you allow all these people to overcome you, your name will be out of the book of life. Look at it. It's the one that overcomes. You overcome temptation. You overcome all the overtures and all the things that the prostitutes and those, whatever they call themselves, all that they are trying to sell to you, they want to sell their body to you. When you overcome, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white trimming, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And some of you that have messed up your lives, and adultery has overcome you, fornication has overcome you, and your maid in your house that ought to be cleaning your shoe has seen your nakedness. And your name is out of the book of life, and you come over here preaching and shouting on the microphone, as if you are still there. Why don't you get back tonight to the cross and to Calvary. Before the day is over. Before the congress is over. And say, yes, Lord, you have found me out. I know my name is no more there. Because I've been overcome. by these works of the flesh. But he that overcometh shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I'm looking at now verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord is knocking at the door of your heart today. He says, I want to come back into you. My presence is not enough in your life now. I want to be mightily present in your life and prominent in your life. I want to become preeminent in your life. It says, come on here. See where you put me. You don't even reckon with me. You put me in a corner and say, you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm not preeminent in your life. I want admission. I want to come back into your heart. I want to come back into your life. I want to make you an overcomer because it's when I live on the throne of your heart and you give me a chance to live big in your life, I'll make you an overcomer. The Lord will make you an overcomer. I said the Lord will make you an overcomer. Why don't you rise up and say, yes, Lord, that's what I'm waiting for. Make me an overcomer. Make me an overcomer. And when he makes you an overcomer, you overcome sin. You overcome the flesh. You overcome temptation. You overcome the devil. You overcome the world. You overcome all these practices of the world. You overcome. You overcome. You overcome. It is then. All these promises will be yours. And then he that overcomes, it will inherit.